Hello and welcome to another Renegade Economist talk show. This week we're with Nick Shackson. Nick is a writer, journalist and tax investigator and of course, as you know, the author of Treasure Island, The Men Who Stole the World. Nick, thank you so much for swinging by. Good to talk to you. Um, let's start um, by framing this of where we are generally in the world, if you like. Barely a day goes by where there isn't a banking scandal, but barely a day goes by where there isn't a corporate tax avoidance issue. Um, we all work addresses it directly. Just give us a snapshot into where you think we're, we're at at the moment. Well, corporate tax avoidance is one part of a much bigger picture. I mean, the, the, the broad area that interests me is, is tax havens. And um, for me, a tax haven is not just about tax. Tax is a very important part of it. But essentially, these are places that uh, offer escape routes. Um, they offer escape routes generally for the wealthiest or wealthier sections of society. Um, if they don't like the rules and responsibilities of the society they're operating in, they can take their money elsewhere, escape those rules. And those rules might be tax, but they might be financial regulation, they might be uh, criminal laws, they might be disclosure and transparency, um, they might be inheritance rules, whatever it is. But tax havens, um, I take a very broad view of what tax havens are. and. All of these things fall into, fall into the, 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 the bracket of offshore. And the word offshore conjures up a, um, the notion, this notion of elsewhere. And for me, tax havens are really about these two words. One is escape, and the other is elsewhere. Take your money elsewhere to escape the rules you don't like at home. So where are we um, in dealing with this general issue? I think the progress that has been made in the last few years, there has undoubtedly been progress is that a phenomenon that was previously viewed as something that was a marginal exotic sideshow of interest to a few you know, tax experts and so on has gone mainstream. And I think if we're looking to tackle this big phenomenon, this broad phenomenon, which is at the heart of the global economy today, uh, we need engagement from the general public. This is not something that politicians are going to lead on. Politicians are going to have to be pushed to do something. So what, where we've got so far is that we have got a change from a position where nobody was talking about it to a change where, a position, where politicians are now in some countries, including the UK, where politicians are saying something must be done about this. But we haven't got much beyond that point. There hasn't been very much. There have been a few uh, changes in international rules and guidelines about secrecy, for example, but these are still relatively small changes. There have been some efforts made to try and look at the problem of corporate tax avoidance. But we haven't got beyond really vague promises on that and some recipes that have been put forward which, in my opinion, aren't really going to solve the problem. It's really tough, isn't it? It's a really tough sell because as soon as you mention that three-letter word, uh, three letter word you know, it's, barely, it's not sex, is it? It's tax. And, it and does it's, end it, in X, anyway. it, it does, Yeah, <laughs> but, there's, there's, and, but you, and, it's, and if sex sells, tax doesn't, right? Um, how do you start to get people to a position where they do understand it enough in what is a fiendishly complicated structure to then pressure uh, their elected leaders to do something about it? Well, I think there are two, there are really two ways of looking at it. Um, one, the, the sort of way that's always been um, treated generally, if we're looking at these complicated offshore tax avoidance and evasion stories, you can either look at it through a legal lens, you know, is this stuff legal? Uh, and then you have to get into very complicated yes. kind of, uh, discussions about whether it breaks this rule or that rule. And, um, or you can look at it from an economic perspective. Is this stuff causing, uh, um, allowing the wealthiest sections of society to escape their responsibilities from paying tax? And with this stuff, it's, that's a very simple story. This is being put on the agenda now, it has been put on the agenda, but government's response so far have been very feeble and in the case of the UK and the UK tax system the government has been saying we're, we're going to do something about it and they've been going in exactly the opposite <laughs> direction. So your background, um, you came at this really uh, as in the tax avoidance issue uh, broadly, uh, you came at it from your background in Africa and, and writing a lot about the resource curse as, it, as it's put, can you just talk a bit about this? Yeah, I was struck by the astonishing similarity between what I saw in Africa and what I see in a place like the UK with a large financial sector. Um, in Africa, the countries I looked at, from Angola up to Nigeria, had totally dominant oil sectors. And the UK has a totally dominant financial sector. 
The resource curse, uh, basically, you have all this money coming into these countries and um, a weak version of the curse says that this money is being wasted, it's not being spent properly, it's a disaster from that point of view. But a much stronger version of the curse, which I'm, uh, Angola is the country I know best and this applied absolutely in Angola when I was there, is that not only is this money being wasted, it's even worse than that. These countries are worse off, the lot of the ordinary person in, in Angola is has been worse off because of all this oil and, and, and the diamonds. So it's better um, even if the oil hadn't been discovered? It's better, yes. Angola would have been a much more peaceful country if, if when I was there than if all, you know, all this oil hadn't been discovered. So it's a very damning thing. Is this but the Dutch disease? Sorry to... Well, the Dutch disease is a part of the resource right. curse. The Dutch disease is, is a price level effect. So when all this money comes in, local price levels rise yeah. and um, make everything very expensive. And that, that the whole environment becomes expensive and then it's difficult for agriculture and manufacturing and other sectors to compete with imports. And those, so those sectors wither and die. Mm -hmm. And the, the oil sector becomes ever more dominant. But the re at the expense of the real economy? At the expense of the real economy. Right. You also have huge volatility in commodity prices that causes huge turbulence in these places. Yeah. Um, you also have a huge set of governance effects um, that, that damage institutions and the rule of law and so on in these places. Um, one aspect of that is, is what's called economic rents, where basically the oil revenues are coming in, you put put a well in the ground, it squirts up obligingly into the air, and easy money, hey, happy days. But Free money? Uh, yes, free money. It's, and like a, it's like a cash point in the ground. Well, it's like a cash point, but it's not being debited from your bank account. Lovely. But it's being debited from someone else's account somewhere in the future. Trying to sell the words economic rents, though, from experience, tough, tough sell, another tough sell. It is, I think with oil, economic rents is fairly easy for people to understand. With I money, think. with lending um, money, economic rents? Well, exactly, and I think there is a whole element to be, to be said here. There, there are all sorts of similarities between the resource curse and what I see in the UK and has sometimes been called the finance curse, where you have a huge financial sector, you have all this volatility that we've seen recently that's kind of similar to what I saw in the resource curse. You have um, possibly big Dutch disease effects in countries like the UK where other sectors have kind of been priced out by the dominance of the city. You have the brain drain um, from all the other sectors, from government, from the, the you know, science community, non, from everything, yes, into the city of London, just as you had in these other countries. Brain drain into the oil sector. Everybody wants to work in that play, in that sector because that's where the salaries are. Governments lose interest in the difficult challenges of making manufacturing work. I saw that in Africa all the time because they've got this easy oil money. You see something rather similar here. You know, the shiny, exciting, high tech city of London. Governments want, you know, Tony Blair wants to schmooze with all the hedge fund leaders, David Cameron, the, the same. And Gordon Brown wants and to do more to encourage the risk takers, match and house speech, if you yes. remember. Yes, and, and, it's, and, and, and so this kind of love affair with this very exciting, Fire wealthy, sector, yeah. wealthy sector just distracts attention, you know, government attention from where, from other sectors that really need it. So you get these whole, all these sets of factors are incredibly... Uh, familiar to me when I started studying financial centres and tax havens. I just sort of, I've seen that before, cool. I saw it yeah. in Africa. To, to quote Martin Wolf on, on the FT, he says, by disproportionately benefiting high collateral stroke low pro uh, productivity projects, the fire sector, financial sector, uh, real estate insurance, grows more quickly uh, at the expense of the real economy. But that's counterintuitive to what every politician is talking about because they think that this is their cash cow, you know, get house prices up again, we'll win the next election. Absolutely. This is, the, for me, the big mistake. Um, there is quite a bit of research now coming out. That study that Martin Wolf cites um, follows some other studies by the Bank for International Settlements and others um, that basically um, have found that financial sector growth is good up to a point. Once you reach that, reach that point, then, you keep growing, and then it starts to harm, it starts yes. to eat away at your economy. Yes. And that is a kind of intuitive. You know, the, the financial sector does provide a utility. It does provide ATM machines and and loans for businesses. Um, but above that point, it starts to become a, a, a sort of self-eating, a self-reinforcing thing, and it starts to feed off the local economy because it's not actually producing, you know, the statistics for how much lending is actually going to, to real British businesses are absolutely frightening, less than 2%, and nearly, nearly all of it is, is somehow related to the housing market. So this is a sector that is no longer servicing, no longer providing the utility that it should, and a much smaller financial sector, um, all the evidence shows, not just in Britain, but in many countries, would be much better for economic growth. You would get a much more balanced economy, you would get a stronger growing economy. Economic rent, 
rent seeking and um, the fact that rent seekers, we say it regularly, have captured government has meant that the housing market has become a Ponzi scheme uh, in this country. What's your view on that? Is that a fair assessment? Well, it certainly looks like that to me. Um, I think there are two aspects to it. I mean, I've for years and years thought this is a Ponzi scheme. I assumed that when the financial crisis came, uh, you would see a, a gigantic collapse, and that didn't happen. And I think one of the things, one of the reasons, uh, I mean, you did have you, you did have a certain you know a stagnation at lower levels, but at the top of the market, you continue to have. Um, uh, growth yeah. at, the, at the top of the market and it's still growing and I think behind that is the fact that Britain has increasingly been creating a model of itself as a tax haven as a as an offshore center um, a place a haven for foreign money so this is huge amounts of foreign money coming into the top end of the residential property market but you know I've spoken to inve you know investors in this market people who are buying properties from Malaysia and so on and and they say yeah it's a simple it's just a very simple formula you know I I bought here values continue to rise I encourage my friends to buy here I told them look at all the money I've made they've come in they've made money they've told all their friends that to me sounds like bubble talk that to me sounds like uh, a ponzi scheme uh, an unsustainable uh, you know pyramid of rising prices Where's it going to stop? I've been expecting it to, to stop for a long time, but it continues to rise. So this is very much rent seeking money coming in. This is uh, there are no there, there are almost no true entrepreneurs and you know, real genuine mm. business creation people. This is people who are getting monopolistic control of certain sectors, um, getting hold of oil fields and things like that. And it's that kind of money that's coming in. So not only is this creating all sorts of havoc in, in the UK, but it's uh, it's, uh, you know, a symptom of of havoc and, and, you know, bad things that are happening in other countries as well. Do you think people are getting wise to the word rent-seeking? Because, because, you know, before 2008, it was totally out of the lexicon. And now, increasingly, people are using it. I think language is incredibly important here. Mm. I think um, when, you're, when you're looking at um, fighting battles on this terrain, the language is absolutely crucial. Rent-seeking is halfway between an academic term and a popular term I think it has that slight academic tinge that isn't quite uh, it, it puts a lot of people off I, I don't have a better word um, there's another word which is my personal bugbear um, which is the word competition or competitive the, the word competition as it applies to companies in a market is one thing um, and there's a whole economic theory and many if not most people would regard competition generally as a good thing um, for all its warts you know it, it, it causes markets to, to you know, keep the best, uh, most efficient, uh, best prices of goods and services. But people are talking about countries being competitive. Britain must stay competitive. We must cut our taxes on capital to stay competitive. Yeah. Um, and this, it sounds so brilliant. This is a word, this is an incredibly powerful word. The trouble is with this word, when you apply it to a country, is it is economic nonsense. Um, cutting taxes on multinational corporations or giving them special favours or whatever, um, at the end of the day does nothing to make Britain more competitive because taxes viewed from the perspective of a company it looks like a cost mm. uh, and it may make that company able to compete in markets better um, more easily with this tax subsidy. But looked at it from the perspective of a country, a tax cut is not a cost but a transfer, it's a transfer from one sector to another. There is no economic relation between uh, the competitiveness of a country and the competitive competitiveness of a, com of a company. Yet politicians in particular just use this term as if it's always a good thing and people accept it, just competitive must be good, we must be competitive. And the arguments end there. And, and so these kinds of words I think are tremendously important. I think rent seeking is something, I think it is getting out there, I think it is um, a, a term that is, that is coming out there. but. Um, if someone can think up a better term, a more populist term that really captures what's going on, I think that will be a very useful thing. That's the job to, to um, punters and viewers have come up with a better term than rent seeking and good luck. And um, competitive as and well. And competitive, competitive rent seeking. <laughs> Maybe the cont competitive rent seeking party, we should start a political movement. Right? Yes. Um, so, uh, so where, uh, we can't uh, end on a, on a you know, it's, it's, it's all woefully bad note. There must be some glimmer of hope. Bono? <laughs> Bono, yes. Will he sort it out? <laughs> huh? 
Bono is actually, um, strangely, he is a tax avoider. Um, he's been using Ireland and, and his band has been using Ireland to, to dodge all sorts of Irish He's taxes. been using the Netherlands, hasn't he? Yes. That's yeah, Dutch sorry, disease been, yes, right Yes, he's been there. using the Netherlands, yes, sorry. Yes. Ireland, um, he's, yes. he's um, defrauding... Oh, yeah. Yes, it's a, and yet he's been, and he's been using the language that is the classic Irish tax haven language. It's this, again, it's this word competitive. He's using that language. He's saying, you know, this is Ireland. This is a clever model. We've been competitive. We've, uh, you know, I'm, I'm joining this model. Um, he's in harmony with the Irish philosophy. Yes. And yet at the same, so he's, he's That's quite he happy says. to fleece the Irish taxpayer. Yes. Um, and yet his organisation is also doing some things in this area, starting to engage in this area of tax avoidance in developing countries. And, uh, you know, some beneficial things that it's doing. So on the one hand, there is some benefit coming out of his organization, or potentially there will be because they're just engaging on it. On the other hand, there's a great big hypocrisy there. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of, uh, uh, of uh, Paul Hewitt, I think is his real name. Paul Hewitt, otherwise known as Bono. Bono. I mean, it sounds yes. like a dog biscuit. But a glimmer of hope, you know, I think the glimmer of hope for me is the, is the kind of wake up that's happening, I think. Right. Um, I think the crisis, unfortunately, we haven't really seen an overturning of kind of econom economic shibboleths that have been so prevalent, but we have seen, you know, we've seen it being questioned. Um, so really the, the positive note I think is a potential that I see there. I think, you know, the, the, the sort of undercurrents of change are, are there, but I think the political parties are running behind uh, the times. I think, uh, you know, that hopefully they will, they will start to catch up. And I don't think this is, you know, the, the, the things that interest me, tax avoidance and so on, um, tax havens, they're not really a left, it's not really a left-right agenda. A lot of people think that I, you know, I'm very opposed to generally what, what happens in tax. So you're a, you're a crank, you're a lefty crank. Well, people, that would be people the terminology. will say that, I will, that I'm, a, I'm a lefty, mm. but I don't, I don't buy that. Um, I know that a lot of people in, you know, that I work with would regard themselves as left-wingers. But I think this is, this is an issue where you can, you can make a very reasonable argument to people on the right of the political spectrum saying this stuff is distorting markets, this is rent seeking, this is not productive, this is not helping the country. Um, and you do, you do get a, a significant audience on the right as well and I think it's very important to try and encourage that. So we've got to redefine rent seeking or get it into the lexicon and get it understood. Understand that competition uh, at, at nation level is actually uh, a, a camouflage for for tax avoidance, or or, or not uh, not applying taxes in in a way that builds infrastructure. Not just on tax, but you talk about you see competitive in in the field of financial regulation. You know, we must be competitive on on regulation, yeah. and you always see New York and the, and the City of London kind of vying with each other. We've got to yeah. be competitive with them. We've got to be competitive with the Swiss. We must deregulate, particularly before the crisis. Yes. Just, this stuff was going on all, all the time. This word competitive. So it's a kind of, and, and it's the kind of the same sort of argument on tax that there's nothing competitive about winning a race to the bottom. Um, That's the key point, isn't it? There's nothing yes. competitive about running running a race to the bottom. When's the UK housing market going to blow up? Give me a date and a time. <laughs> I want a time, a date, and um, where Remember where you'll be when it happens. Okay. Um, <laughs> When is the UK housing market going to blow up? Okay, you're going to, I'm going to make a totally flippant comment. Let's oh. say, let's say, um, everyone's going to hold you to it. Let's say June, June the twenty fifth, twenty fifth, yeah, twenty. Go on. Uh, this is the good bit. Fifteen. Fifteen. <laughs> you heard it here first, uh, Nick. So June twenty fifth, twenty fifteen. UK housing market over. Last bit. Uh, hopeful bit. Last hopeful bit. Public awakening, housing market capitulates, uh, you set up a political party, your Prime Minister, first, first action, what would you do? <laughs> Ban you too from performing in London. <laughs> I, would, I would start straight away to make the case for a smaller, a smaller financial sector, whatever route was taken to achieve that. Because once you, have, once you have that as a goal, you say this financial sector is too big, growth is suffering in this country as a result of over-dominance, then a whole range of options start opening up, start making the case to shrink the City of London, to make it smaller. And then you can start looking at the housing, housing market, you can look at rent seeking, you can look at tax, you can look at all of these things. But I think that will be a very useful, you can also look at tax havens as well, um, because Britain is surrounded by this network of British tax havens. But you'd, you'd start from that point. I think that will be an excellent starting point, saying this financial sector is too big, it's too dominant, um, it's too politically dominant, obviously. Um, 
and then a whole range of possibilities open up. And I think you'd get a very big uh, public response to that, a very positive public response, if you started to frame the arguments properly. I'd vote for it. Many others would, and I'm sure a lot of people watching. Nick, thank you so much. If you haven't read um, Treasure Island, The Men Who Stole the World Do, uh, excellent, and well done on doing it. It must have Thanks. been uh, years of graft. It was, yes. Um, uh, so great work, and onwards. Thank you. That's it for The Renegade Economist this week. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Thank <laughs> you.